2021. And we are live. Hope everybody's doing well today. So welcome to the African History Network show. Uh, we have a jam-packed show today. Um, the story about Billy Holiday, jazz singer Billy Holiday, is out and people are talking about it. Remember Lady Sings the Blues from the 1970s starring Diana Ross and Billy Dee Williams. Uh, but Andre Day uh, portrays uh, Andre, Andre Day portrays uh, Billie Holiday in the United States versus Billie Holiday, the United States versus Billie Holiday. So uh, today's show, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the United States versus Billie Holiday and the war on drugs and the war on drugs. Now, in the film, and hopefully I, I don't hopefully we don't have any spoiler alerts. Um, in the conversation in this broadcast today, but <laughs> if we do, I mean, well, I mean, it can't be, you know how movie, you know how it ends up. Billy Holiday dies at age forty-four. Okay, so we we, we uh, you know uh, we know how it ended up. Uh, but anyway, um, portrayed in the movie is Harry J. Anslinger. Harry J. Anslinger was the first chairman of the of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, and you've heard me talk about Harry J. Anslinger. Uh, on this show numerous times in the past because Harry J. Anslinger is one of the main reasons why uh, marijuana was made illegal in 1937 because of the marijuana prohibition tax. And even though uh, I'm not a Lee Daniels fan, if you watch my show, you watch my show, you've seen my broadcast in the past, you know that uh, this is this this movie, I think, is something that everybody should see. And the reason why is because it ties into a lot of history. Lee Daniels is the director. You know, I'm not a fan of Precious or uh, The Butler or uh, definitely not Empire. But because uh, Billie Holiday was a historic figure and she used her platform to speak out against the, the injustice and the lynchings of African-Americans. And this is what the song Strange Fruit is about. And the United States government saw her, especially Harry J. Harry J. Anslinger, who was a who was a, a white supremacist bigot who hated African Americans, who used the N word frequently, because he deemed her such a threat. Uh, you know, they brought her down. He had her set up. They brought her down. Uh, so we're going to talk uh, some about this, and and this film ties directly into history, and it ties into the. Uh, history of the war on drugs. And I did a uh, presentation in uh, 2016 dealing with the history of the war on drugs, going back to Richard Nixon's war on drugs that was declared June 17th, 1971. OK, I know a lot of people think mass incarceration started with the 1994 crime bill. I don't know where the hell you got that from. That's just blatantly false. That means you, you don't understand history because the U.S. prison population quadrupled from uh, 1970 to 1993. So I don't know where people got that nonsense from. But uh, when we deal with the war on drugs, it's rooted in racism. And and doing my research, preparing uh, for my presentation I did in 2016, dealing with the uh, history of Richard Nixon's war on drugs, as long as white people were using these drugs, it wasn't a problem. The problem came when African Americans started using the drugs, when the Chinese were using the drugs. Uh, now, all of a sudden, now they want to pass new laws to restrict the drugs and they want to criminalize. It. OK, when we look at the first, basically the first drug laws in this country, go back to 1875 in California, uh, in San Francisco, dealing with uh, opium. And these are the anti-opium laws because Chinese men who were working to build the railroads, they were using opium. And the fear was, what happens when these Chinese men are high on opium? Are they going to try to rape white women? So we're going to deal with uh, this history here. And those who saw the movie, uh, let me know what you uh, let me know what you think about it. But uh, what I'm going to do is deal with a lot of history surrounding what you saw in the movie. OK, so whether you like the movie or not or have you, that's not the point. The point is understanding this history, okay, and understanding what it is that we see 
uh, uh, depicted in front of us and, and understanding how uh, the war on drugs still impacts us today, even though under the Obama administration, the war on drugs was winding down. And the U.S. prison population dropped to its lowest point in 20 years in December 2015 under President Barack Obama. U.S. prison population of African-Americans dropped from about uh, 40 percent down to uh, about 34 percent. OK, nobody wants to talk about that unless you watch this show. We deal with that here. All right. We're talking about the United States versus Billie Holiday and the war on drugs. Now, Billie Holiday spent much of her career being adored by fans in the 1940s. The U.S. government targeted Billie Holiday in a growing effort to racialize the war on drugs and a growing effort to racialize the war on drugs. Now, but but to just be honest, the, the reason why you had a war on drugs is because of African-Americans, and Hispanics and, you know, Latinos, Asians, things like this. As long as white people were using marijuana, it wasn't a problem. Cocaine used to be legal. All these drugs were legal in this country. You, you've got to understand history, understand this stuff. OK, all these drugs were legal. As, as, as long as white people were using cocaine, it wasn't a problem. OK, when African-American men start using cocaine, then you get the uh, uh, the article from the New York Times, February 8th, 1914, uh, called Negro dealing with Negro cocaine fiends. OK, Negro cocaine fiends uh, have have turned to uh, sniffing. Uh, now that uh, whiskey is pro, uh, is prohibited, okay? It, it, it was a big article. It, let, let, let's pull this up here. Um, we're coming up on the break. Uh, I want you to see this. Now, this is from the New York Times, February 8th, 1914. You hear me talk about the fact that I have a subscription to the New York Times? The reason why I have a subscription to the New York Times is because in 2016, when I was doing my research dealing with the history of the war on drugs, I came across this article from the New York Times that was 100 years old. It's from February 8th, 1914. Negro cocaine fiends are a new Southern menace, murder and insanity increasing among lower class blacks because they have taken to sniffing since deprived of whiskey prohibition. This is an actual article from the New York Times, February 8th, 1914. And since it was over 100 years old, you had to get a, a digital subscription to be able to access their database to read the article. So that's why I have a, that's how I end up getting a subscription to The New York Times. And it talks about in this article, in this article, and there have been others written about it since then. Uh, it talks about how the fear was what would happen when these black men were high on cocaine. They, they asked the question, do 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 uh, uh, police officers? now need to carry a 45 caliber handgun to kill a Negro high on cocaine because a, a 38 is not powerful enough to do so. So you got to understand the history of this country to understand the laws in this country. All right. Uh, so we'll deal with this on the other side of the break. Listen to the African History Network show right uh, right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation of Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History One on One Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal's Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History One on One Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al Hakim directly at 313 645 4197. 313-645-4197 or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com that's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com you can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com 
bhistory101 at yahoo.com. Are you getting ready for fall or winter? We have the solution for all seasonal clothing needs. Cometicwear.com is the go-to online source for Cometic African fashion and lifestyle products with a contemporary twist. We're committed to offering unique styles reflecting our African heritage. Cometicwear.com is inspired by Cometicscribes.com to influence our people in learning and showing pride. Please visit our website at Cometicwear.com. Hi, I'm Joel Wilson, President and CEO of JCW Computer Consulting LLC, a technology implementation firm with over 20 years of satisfying customers. We offer a full spectrum of industry top-tier branded services. We are an authorized partner or reseller for Lenovo, Zoom, T-Mobile, Microsoft 365, and Surface Tablet, Google Workspace, Acer, Asus, Samsung, PCmatic security software, and many more. Our online store features laptops, Chromebooks, computers, printers, accessories, and software. Businesses, Take advantage of our free one-hour Zoom tech consultation and know we offer top nationwide high-speed internet service providers, voice over IP, and cellular phone services. Home users, don't miss our current in-stock Chromebook inventory. Please visit us at jcwcc.com or call 215-879-6701. Digital Dandelion's technical solutions works with businesses like yours to create an operations manual for your business, which is something many businesses don't have. According to AARP, more than 30% of small business owners are over 50 years old. Many business owners want to retire by selling their businesses or by passing their businesses on to their children. However, according to Forbes Investment Advisors, Many retiring owners attempts to sell their businesses for retirement fail. You cannot sell your business without a business manual. Your children also cannot inherit your business because there is no way to run it. Your business does not have to die when you leave. Their business Bible product will give you the tools you need for a thriving business that can make you money even after you retire. Are you looking at increasing your business's annual revenue? Digital Dandelions can help you make at least $100,000 in annual revenue and expand your business. Speak with them today about solidifying your business. Visit DigitalDandelions.com today and get a free 30-minute consultation. Stand by, everybody. How you doing, Ivory? Go my frat. Now, this is an article here from thenation.com. I'm not going to stop for the break. Damn the break. We're going to keep going. How the myth of the Negro cocaine fiend helped shape American drug policy. Now, this is from thenation.com talking about the article from the New York Times and what was taking place at that time in 1914. Okay. All right. So. Everybody stand by. Uh, we'll be back from the break in just a minute. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have the question or, a question or comment. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. See, people don't understand history. You have to understand history to understand the laws. You have to understand the laws and policies to understand conditions. Okay, we'll be back from breaking two minutes. I got to get ready for this next segment here. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation of Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, February 28th. 
2021 and we are live Hope everybody's doing well calling number is 313-778-7600 313-778-7600 is the calling number if you have a question or comment okay so we're talking about the new movie from director lee daniels the united states versus billy holiday the united states versus billy holiday and we're discussing the United States versus Billy Holiday and the war on drugs. The United States versus Billy Holiday and the war on drugs. Okay, you can give us a call if you have a question or comment. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. 313-778-7600. So right before the break, I was talking about uh, going back, dealing with some of the history of the war on drugs. You have to understand history you have to understand the historical events the policies the ideologies that brought us to where we are today if you don't understand the laws you don't understand what's going on today all this is rooted in racism racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race racism occurs when one race of people control the majority of the wealth, power, resources, benefits, privileges, land, access to education, access to opportunity, and they use that to marginalize, subordinate, and do harm to another race of people. Okay, this comes out of the ideology of European white supremacy, and this is for the purpose of preserving genetic white survival on a planet that's less than 10% European. This, this, this is what you have to understand, okay? Um, and the reason why African Americans understanding our history is so important is because the people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. A people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. Okay, so, um, we're going to go to clip one in just a second here, Jalen. Uh, the interview with um, Lee Daniels. We'll go to that in just a second. So Billie Holiday spent much of her career being ad adored by fans in the 1940s. The U.S. government targeted Billie Holiday in a growing effort to racialize the war on drugs, ultimately aiming to stop her from singing her controversial ballad, Strange Fruit, which is about the lynchings that were taking place in this country. All right. And it's important to note as we talked about a couple of weeks ago when we talked about uh, um, Auschwitz in, in Poland and the anniversary of um, uh, the in World War II, the troops liberating the prisoners, uh, the, uh, the Jewish prisoners of the Holocaust in Auschwitz, liberating them. Hitler patterned the Nuremberg laws in Nazi Germany. He patterned those laws after the segregation and Jim Crow laws here in the U.S., but they didn't. But, but but Hitler felt that the Jim Crow segregation laws here in the U.S. did not go far enough. All right, do you have to understand how all this history is connected? So, uh, jazz legend Billie Holiday poured her heart into each song, making each one her own with her distinct style. Now, I, uh, uh, Andre Day, I think, did a fantastic job portraying Billie Holiday. And personally, I think Andre Day could also portray Eartha Kitt because Andre Day looks like Eartha Kitt also. And Eartha Kitt was persecuted by President Lyndon Johnson, blackballed, banned from the White House as well for speaking out in opposition to the Vietnam War and, and especially uh, African-American uh, soldiers being killed in the Vietnam War. She was uh, uh, Eartha Kitt was blackballed. Now, Billie Holiday was born on April 17th. 1915. And she once said, quote, if I'm going to sing like someone else, then I don't need to sing at all. If I'm going to sing like someone else, then I don't need to sing at all. She saw her voice as a musical instrument. And she explained in Hear Me Talking to You, Hear Me Talking to You by Nate, by Nat Shapiro and Nat Hentoff, quote, I feel like I am playing a horn. I try to improvise. What comes out is what I feel. What comes out is what I feel. There's a scene in the movie 
in the beginning where uh, she's she's singing all of me and she she's being interviewed in the beginning of the movie. She's being interviewed by uh, Reginald Lord Devine, May 3rd, 1957. And she 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 talks about how they don't want me to sing Strange Fruit. Now, she dies two years later, 1959. Um, she, she talks about how they don't want me to sing Strange Fruit. They just want me to sing All of Me. OK, now the song All of Me. Um, um, and, and I'll pull up the lyrics here. You know, why don't you take, you know, all of me? Why don't you take all of me? That is a song. It, we've all heard that song. If, if you haven't heard uh, Billie Holiday sing the song, you've heard Fred Sanford sing the song. OK, because on the episode of Sanford and the Son, I think it was he and Scatman Crothers. Uh, they sing the song All of Me. And it's, and it's, and it's, it's Fred Sanford, Red Fox singing the song. OK. Well, that is uh, now. This is not the All of Me by John Legend. I don't want people to be people that the, 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 the Generation Z Y. Uh, no, this ain't John Legend All of Me. Okay, this is <laughs> this is Billy Holiday All of Me. Okay, <laughs> um, so, but it, it's uh, uh, Red Fox and uh, Scatman Crothers singing All of Me. Okay, uh. You took my kisses and all my love. You taught me how to care. Uh, you said, let me see, all of me. Why not, why, not, why not take all of me? Can't you see I'm no good without you? Take my lips. I want to lose them. Take my arms. I'll never use them. Okay. Your goodbye left me. Uh, your goodbye left me with eyes that cry. How can I go on, dear, without you? You took the part that once was my heart. So why not take all of me? That's Fred. That's Fred Sanford and Scatman Crothers. That's Red Fox and Scatman Crothers singing that on on Sanford and Son. Okay, that's Billie Holiday. And and one of the things that's important, and this ties into, uh, I had other topics planned for tonight, but I was doing research on this movie. We're gonna get to those other topics Monday. We're gonna this this is important right here. If you if you remember. Uh, and 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. Uh, if you remember a couple weeks ago, maybe about three weeks ago, I talked about Zara Cully. Okay, Zara Cully. Now, the name Zara Cully may not seem familiar to you, but everybody knows Zara Cully because Zara Cully was Mother Jefferson on the Jeffersons. Okay? Um, so Zara Cully, she was 86 years old when she passed away. She passed away in about 1978. Okay. And, you know, she, they wrote that into the script that she passed away. All right. Uh, on, on Good Time. I mean, um, the Jeffersons. But Zara Cully was born in 1892. Zara Cully, who we saw on the Jeffersons as Mother Jefferson, Zara Cully was born in 1892. Zara Cully was born three years before Frederick Douglass died. Frederick Douglass died in 1895. Zara Cully, who we saw in Living Color on Good uh, on uh, uh, on the Jeffersons, Zara Cully was born before Harriet Tubman died in 1913, before Booker T. Washington died in 1915, and before Frederick Douglass died in 1980 in, in 1895. So when we watch a lot of these shows, whether it's Sanford and Son, and they're singing, and they're, and they're singing uh, "Stormy Weather," uh, "Don't Know Why There's No Sun Up in the Sky" by by uh, Lena Horne, and that ties into a deep history. Whether they're singing "All of Me" by Billie Holiday, and that ties into a deep history, or whether we see uh, Zara Cully, who 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 is she's such a historic figure, we just don't know it. I mean, I, I would like to have a half hour conversation with this sister. Imagine, I mean, she's born like 27 years after slavery ended. It's possible that she knew like former slaves. Right. So all this history is connected. OK, so. Um, let's go back to um, Billie Holiday here. So not only. Did Billie Holiday mesmerize with her voice? Not only did she mesmerize with her voice, but Billie Holiday also lived a fascinating life filled with tremendous ups and downs. 
She managed to survive a difficult childhood, often left in the care of cold heart, cold hearted relatives, even spent time in the Catholic reform school before joining her mother in New York City. She was a victim of sexual abuse. Her drug addiction was related to the sexual abuse that she sustained as a child and never healed from, really. Um, before she found fame as a singer, Billie Holiday did whatever it took to survive, including working as a prostitute for a while. She became one of jazz, uh, uh, jazz music's great stars, performing with the likes of Count Basie and Artie Shaw. Billie Holiday even appeared in, the, in, in a film with Duke Ellington. Her great talent, however, was later diminished by a bad relationship and alcohol and drug abuse, but she was also set up by Harry J. Ang's dazzling, a white supremacist, bigot, racist. She's also set up by him as well. Okay. Uh, so I, I want to go to this clip here. This is from um, The Cross Connection, Tiffany Cross, MSNBC. She spoke with uh, director Lee Daniels, director of the film The United States versus Billie Holiday. And he, uh, Lee Daniels, refers to uh, Billie Holiday. Uh, he, as the first civil rights activist. She was a, you, you could say she was a civil rights activist. She wasn't the first civil rights activist. I don't know where, where the hell he has got that from. But. Okay, let, let's go to this clip, Jalen. What is the government's problem with Billie Holiday? Why is the government always after you? My song, Strange Fruit. It reminds them that they're killing us. Well, why don't you stop singing the damn song? Wouldn't your life be easier if you just behaved? Hulu's latest biopic, The United States vs. Billie Holiday, portrays how the U.S. government used the jazz great's drug addiction against her to stop her from seeing Strange Fruit, a song about the horrors of lynching, which has become an everlasting reminder of what it means to be black in the United States as gentlemen and ladies sing the blues. Joining me to discuss this amazing film is the director of the United States versus Billie Holiday, the amazing Lee Daniels. Uh, Lee Daniels, I'm so, so thrilled to have this conversation with you. I was obsessed with Billie Holiday when I was younger, and I was I watched Lady Sings the Blues maybe over a hundred times. So you read this <laughs> unique perspective of her life. The film is so awesome, and you know I think you're an artistic genius. So tell me what was the most challenging thing about bringing this film to life? Tiffany, like you, I was a kid when I saw Lady Sings the Blues, and it affected me deeply. I think that that is the, I know that that is the reason why I am doing film today, because I had never seen, like, I'd never seen black people so elegant, and, and the music, and Diana Ross at her height, and Billy Dee Williams, which are prior. But I think that that's what black people needed, you know, at the time. We needed to see that. My parents needed to see that. It wasn't the true story of what uh, Billy Holiday's uh, legacy really was about. Um, I believe that she was the first civil rights leader as we know it to be, that she kicked it off mm. with this song, Strange Fruit. And the government was not having it. And they asked her nicely to stop. She wouldn't. And they came after her. They came after her and dogged her to her death. Southern Street still... Southern trees still bear a strange fruit just by a different name, if you think about it. You talked about how uh, Judy Garland's drug addiction was seen as a health problem, while Billie Holiday's was seen as something to be criminalized. In making this film, you've also talked about your own journey on sobriety, which also hits close to my uh, heart as well. Um, tell me, your uh, what is it like making a film in a clearer state of mind, perhaps, um, as you said you had to be to make this film and bring it to life? Mm -hmm. It's really painful, and it's um, and through this journey, I'd be I'm okay with it uh, to even talk about it. I, I think part of me uh, honoring Billy was to do what it was that she didn't have the support to do, and that's to talk about it openly and candidly. Um, addiction is real, and it's a if, when you look at that black oppression and what they have done to us over the years. I'm surprised we ain't all addicts. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. right. It, it really, you know, it, 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 it's real. And we're embarrassed to talk about it. And I, if I can just help one person by talking about what it is that I've experienced, what Whitney experienced, what Prince mm. experienced, what Michael Jackson experienced, what Billie Holiday experienced, and we could just, if we could save just one life, I'm doing good with this movie. 
I, I love that. So I, I want to ask you about the Golden Globes. Uh, I, this is something, just my own personal perspective. Every year we talk about the lack of diversity in the award shows. And really, I think that these awards matter. You know, like you make great <laughs> I love it. I watch it. You know, what do I care? Right. The, right. The, the, the white, you know, <laughs> acknowledges your work. The people love Listen. it. So let me ask you, do you think these awards matter? I think that, here's the thing. I think that when you think of the reviews that come out with uh, that try to understand me, you know, when they try to really understand that they can actually say that they speak about the lens that I see the world and can judge me for what it is as a black gay man. They can, and the, and the same with the awards. It is a joke. Of course, it's a joke. And I think that sadly we have to embrace it because. Mm, Awards yeah. means more eyeballs on, on our film. So it's this weird sort of, it's this weird sort of, but as I've grown as a filmmaker, girl, bye. You know, you got to do what you got to do. And you know, well enough, I, if I'm hitting you, if I'm hitting my mom, if I'm hitting the people that I've made this film for, that's all that matters really at the end of the day. And, and, and we have to figure out a system that, that works for black cinema, you know, because they change it one or two and then they run with it, you know. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, the people, the rising majority of this country, ride with you, brother. So thank you for all the beautiful work that you've given us. And thank you for taking time out of your Saturday uh, to join me. And everybody, please watch The United States versus Billie Holiday. It's an amazing film. And we, this time went so quick because that's our show for today. Uh, Lee Daniel took us home. Okay, so that is uh, Tiffany Cross from uh, February 27th, 2021. The Cross Connection, MSNBC. Director of the new film, The United States versus Billy Holiday, calls icon first civil rights activist. Now, we can call her a civil rights activist. She wasn't the first. What, what was Ida B. Wells? Ida B. Wells was a co founder of the NAACP in 1909. Come on, Lee. I'm a guy. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, I, I, know you, I know you're trying to sell the movie, but you don't have to oversell it now. Come on. All right. So, uh, all right. So, I, I want to go to a, uh, this is how we're going to do it. I want to go to a brief bio, uh, a brief overview of Billie Holiday. Blackpass.org has a uh, good write up on Billie Holiday. Then we're going to get into uh, Billie Holiday, the United States versus Billie Holiday and the war on drugs, okay, and deal with that history. So Billy Holiday is considered by uh, many, and let me pull this up here. Uh, look at the lyrics to uh, All of Me, because a lot of this stuff, when you start tying what we see in, in some of these shows from the 70s and things like this, right? Uh, and, and this is one of the things I like to do. I like to tie all that into history, because there's history in, in all of this, okay? Uh, and, and a lot of the things that we see on, on television, even though some of it is nonsense, you know, and, you know, there, there are some nonsensical things on on uh, Sanford and Son. I've been critical of that. But there's also things. I mean, there's an episode of Sanford and Son where you remember when uh, Lamont was choking a white woman in the living room. Right? <laughs> that they were they were rehearsing Othello. So then Lamont says Othello was a more. OK, so they put they put that right into the right into the show. <laughs> and then that deals with the history of the Moors in Europe. Taking the teachings from ancient Egypt, ancient Africa into Europe, bringing Europe out of the Dark Ages. All right. And that was a mistake that they did that. But still, you know, it, it's history. OK, so uh, Billy Holiday is considered by many critics. and We'll go to the phone lines in just a minute. Uh, and fans to have been one of the most important jazz vocalists of the 20th century. Her difficult life of poverty, abusive relationships and drug abuse helped give her voice a deep, raw emotion that was expressed in the music she sang. Now, Billie Holiday was born Eleonora Fagan, F-A-G-A-N, Eleonora Fagan on April 7th, 1915 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. To teenaged, uh, she was born to teenaged unmarried parents. Her mother's name was Sarah Julia Sadie, uh, was her nickname, Fagan, Sarah Julia Fagan, and her father's name was Clarence Holiday. H-O-L-I-D-A-Y. Not long after Eleanor's birth, El Eleanor Fagan's birth, Billy Holiday's birth, her father, Clarence Holiday, abandoned his family to pursue a career as a jazz banjo and guitar player. 
because her mother worked as a maid on passenger rail passenger railroads, Billie Holiday was raised by her half sister's mother-in-law, Martha Miller, her half sister's mother-in-law, Martha Miller. Billie Holiday frequently skipped school and was often brought before juvenile court. By age 11, Billie Holiday had dropped out of school after she fought off an attempted rape in 1926. She was held in protective custody and released in 1927 at the age of 12. By the age of 14, uh, Billie Holiday was a prostitute in New York's Harlem. After a brief period when she and her mother were in jail for prostitution. OK, after a brief period when she and her mother were in jail for prostitution, Billie Holiday escaped that life by singing in the Harlem nightclubs. She changed her name, choosing her first name, Billy, after a favorite movie actress, Billy Dove, D-O-V-E, and adopting the surname of her absent musician father, Clarence Holiday. Now, in 1933, 1933, record producer John Haymond heard Billy Holiday sing and arranged for her to make her debut uh, recording in November of 1933 at the age of 18 when the Benny Goodman band, OK, who white people call the king of swing, Benny Goodman. OK, Count Basie was really the king of swing. Or you may, you may say Duke Ellington, but they call Benny Goodman the king of swing. Like they call uh, uh, Elvis Presley the king of rock and roll. There was an article. It, it, it's so many articles that, that, that I posted in with history. We can't get to all of them on the show. But there was an article I posted a few days ago talking about Big Mama Thornton. And Big Mama Thornton was the one who originally recorded Hound Dog. And she basically got pushed to the side once Elvis Presley recorded Hound Dog. OK, and Elvis Presley, his gyrations and things like that. Now, to me, it looked like Elvis Presley was having a fit. OK, the way he danced, it looked like he was having a fit or had ants in his pants or something. But, you know, white teenagers thought he was he could dance to me it looked like he had to go to the bathroom or had ants in his pants or was having a fit. OK, <laughs> you know, and there's some songs by Elvis I like, but it's like, oh, come, slow down. Come on, you know. When 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 Elvis Presley met Lil Richard, Elvis Presley called Lil Richard the king of rock and roll. Come on, come, pump your brakes now. Come on now. All right. <laughs> All right. So begin um, in 1933, uh, record producer John Heyman heard Billie Holiday and arranged for her to make her debut recording in November 1933 uh, at the age of 18 uh, with the Benny Goodman band. Now, her recording, Riffin' the Scotch, Riffin' the Scotch, R-I-F-F-I, apostrophe. This recording sold 5,000 copies, and by 1935, Billie Holiday had signed with Brunswick Records. She teamed up with band leader Teddy Wilson and produced a number of jazz hits. She also reconnected with jazz saxophonist Lester Young, whom she first met in 1934. Uh, Lester Young gave her the nickname Lady Day. Lady Day, and she in turn called him Prez, which was which was short for president of the saxophone, president of the saxophone, because he was a saxophone player. I used to play saxophone like fifth grade, sixth grade. I need to pick that back up. That's the sax you know, saxophone is an African instrument, by the way, also, just like the banjo. OK, they have their origins in Africa. I need to start playing the saxophone again. Now, beginning in 1937, Billie Holiday worked with Count Basie. And by 1938, with Artie Shaw, becoming the first African American woman to sing, uh, African American singer, uh, African American female singer, to tour with a mostly white band. Now, on April 20th, 1939, Billie Holiday recorded her most controversial song, Strange Fruit, Strange Fruit, okay, which was an unabashed protest of Southern lynching. It became her Second biggest selling record, but it also prompted a visit from the FBI. OK, now. Her most popular recording, God Bless the Child, came when Billie Holiday's mother, who became a restaurant owner, refused to give Billie Holiday money. 
Billy Holiday reportedly stormed out of the restaurant saying, God bless the child that, that's got his own. And we and you remember the TV show Rock? Okay. Uh uh, and they would play that song on, on rock and the theme song. Uh, God bless. It. So it was like the first few seasons. Then uh, when En Vogue sung the theme song, then they changed the theme song. But remember uh, on, the, on some early episodes, early seasons of the TV show Rock, God Bless the Child Has Got His Own uh, by Billie Holiday. They played that song. See, all this is like all this stuff is like right there. You see these little elements in TV shows, sitcoms, things like this. So when we see these elements that tie into history, we have to connect all of this together. Okay, so uh, her most popular recording, God Bless the Child, came when Billie Holiday's mother uh, refused to give her any money. Her mother became a restaurant owner. Uh, a band member heard the words, heard Billie Holiday say, God bless the child that's got his own, and turned these words into a song. And Billie Holiday recorded the song in 1940. God Bless the Child became Billie Holiday's only million selling record. God Bless the Child became Billie Holiday's only million copy selling record. After 1940, Billie Holiday moved away from jazz and began to record ballads such as Lover Man, uh, uh, Lover Man Don't, Ex uh, uh, Don't Explain, and uh, Good Morning Heartache. She performed at venues such as a sold out Carnegie Hall in 1948 and later that year starred in a Broadway musical titled Holiday on Broadway. Yet her success was not enduring. After recounting the misery in her personal life and in, in, in song during this period from several abusive husbands, she expressed her emotions in her voice and created extraordinarily powerful recordings against a background of despair and depression. Her addiction to heroin, however, sent her life in a rapid, in a rapid downward spiral in the late 1940s. She was repeatedly arrested and eventually lost her cabaret license in 1950. Now, Billie Holiday's last major hit was Fine and, and Mellow. It was released in 1957. By that point, the years of addiction had taken a toll on Billie Holiday's body and her voice. 44-year-old Billie Holiday died on July 17, 1959, of cirrhosis of the liver at Metropolitan Hospital in New York City. Okay, Now, in the movie, when the movie opens up, uh, it's May 3rd, 1957, and she's being interviewed by Reginald Lord Divine, 1957. That's the same year of her last major hit, Fine and Mellow. Okay, check this uh, entry out here from uh, blackpast.org, blackpast.org. Billie Holiday, 1915 to 1959. Blackpast.org has about 6,000 pages of articles dealing with African history and African American history. Okay, let's go to the phone lines. Let's go to John, line one. John, welcome to the African History Network show. Thanks for holding. Tell us where you're calling from, John. Well, I'm calling from the east side of Detroit, hope there. Thank you for taking my call. All right, no uh, problem. I, I, I want to do a rep and check with you. You said a movie, this movie is going to come out when? It's, like, al it's already out. It's on Hulu. It's on Hulu, the streaming service. Oh, it's already out. Oh, it, okay. it just came out. Uh, is it in a space that you can go by the case or so forth, or the case is moving? Uh, I don't, I don't think you could do that. Uh, this, I think that's a, I think that's illegal, John, but, okay. <laughs> but, but, right, right. You, you, you were, you were speaking, uh, I mean, you, you talked two or three stuff, stuff, but you, you were talking about Egypt and the, and the morals and so forth. Uh huh. Did, did you know who 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 uh hosted uh hosted the 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 overflow overflow the the the, 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 the morals in in Egypt? Uh, you said did okay. Yeah, you, your voice is a little muffled, John. You said now, what about the Moors in Egypt? What'd you say now? I said. Did you realize that it, when they was in, 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 in the in the heyday and, and, and they were controlling a lot of Egypt and so forth, 
And uh, did you know who 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 who, 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 who the the East were overthrown and so forth? And what what's that country name that they they, they bombing now? What what's that country name over there now? When, when, when the Al Qaeda and all of them was going over there. You talking about Afghanistan? You talking about Afghanistan? Iran or Iraq? Who are you talking about? Iraq. Iraq. That's right. Iraq. Okay. Okay, John. All right, John. Thanks for calling. All right. Uh, okay. Let's uh, let's let's continue here. We're coming up on a break here in just a minute, so I want to uh, uh, keep going uh, before the break. Okay. Three one three seven seven eight seventy six hundred is the calling number. If you have a quick question or comment, three one three seven seven eight seventy six hundred is the calling number. Okay, let's see. Why isn't this coming up? All right, we'll pull up this picture once again here. Um, when we come back, uh, we're going to continue this discussion and we're going to get into uh, some history dealing with uh, Harry J. Anslinger uh, and the uh, and the war on drugs. Okay, Harry J. Anslinger, who declared war on uh, Billy Holiday. OK. And this ties into uh, the history of the war on drugs and it deals with racism as well. Uh, and we have to understand that racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race coming out of the ideology of uh, European white supremacy. So, OK, I have to see why this picture is not coming up, but we'll deal with this on the other side of the break. Um, all right, so check out that article from blackpass.org. All right, now there's a, there's a good article from uh, biography.com, biography.com, that deals with uh, Billie Holiday and how the government targeted the strange fruit singer with drug arrests. Billie Holiday and how the government targeted the strange fruit singer with, uh, with uh, drug arrests, okay? Uh, we'll talk about that on the other side of the break. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, WFDF. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Visit 4glossygirls.com, that's the number 4glossygirls.com, and follow them on Instagram at 4glossygirls. Digital Dandelion's technical solutions works with businesses like yours to create an operations manual for your business, which is something many businesses don't have. According to AARP, more than 30% of small business owners are over 50 years old. Many business owners want to retire by selling their businesses or by passing their businesses on to their children. However, according to Forbes Investment Advisors, many retiring owners attempts to sell their businesses for retirement fail. You cannot sell your business without a business manual. Your children also cannot inherit your business. 
because there is no way to run it. Your business does not have to die when you leave. Their business Bible product will give you the tools you need for a thriving business that can make you money even after you retire. Are you looking at increasing your business's annual revenue? Digital Dandelions can help you make at least $100,000 in annual revenue and expand your business. Speak with them today about solidifying your business. Visit DigitalDandelions.com today and get a free 30-minute consultation. We all know the cannabis industry is headed toward an uprise in the past decade. What happens when there is a brand that brings this uprise in a blow? The cannabis industry welcomes her uprise. Hustle Her Hemp. Delivering excellence with pride is her watchword, and how you choose to embrace it makes it a priority. From cultivating rich cannabis into exquisite and tastefully finished CBD products to delivery, Hustle Her Hemp leaves no stone unturned. Hustle Her Hemp's mission is to empower women of color by building business and creating legacies, uniting beauty, health, and business. We are a pure definition of how we want the CBD industry to become in the future. While we are redefining innovation, we bring the same energy to improving the quality of life. Hustle Her Hemp is the new Uprise. Detroit, 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, a division of Adele Media. The views expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 9, 10 a.m. Superstation or Adele Media. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, February 28th, 2021. We are at the end of African American History Month, but we know that we keep going and keep celebrating and studying our history 365 days a year. But we honor Dr. Carter G. Woodson and the Association for the Study of African American Life and History for the creation of Negro History Week, which started uh, the, the second week in February, February 7th, 20, uh, February 7th, 1926. OK, so in our first hour, we talked um, about the movie, The United States versus Billie Holiday, and we talked some about the war on drugs, The United States versus Billie Holiday and the war on drugs. OK, we're going to continue this discussion here and uh, I'm going to share some more articles with you, some, some more history that ties into this. Uh, on the. So the, the, there was a. Uh, article that I saw from the griot.com. Really good article from the Grio. Uh, Andra Day on trauma of portraying Billy Holiday. I hated myself in the moment. Andra Day, who portrayed Billy Holiday, of portraying Billy Holiday, I hated myself in that moment. The Grammy nominated singer opens up about her starring role in the United States versus Billy Holiday. Okay, so we'll try to squeeze that in as well. Now, there was a. Um, so many people saw Lady Sings the Blues, right? And I'm going to pull up some information here dealing with that. Because um, some of these same people we saw uh, portrayed in Lady Sings the Blues. Okay, so uh, Billy D. Williams was Louis McKay. Um, Virginia Capers was uh, Billie Holiday's mother. Um Let's see. Just a second here. I'm looking at this. Go to imdb.com and look up uh, Lady Sings the Blues, okay? And you can start uh, making the connection between some of the actors and who they portrayed. Um, Scatman Crothers was in Lady Sings the Blues. He portrayed a uh, big band. And we know Scatman Crothers and, and Red Fox, they were singing All of Me on an episode of uh, Sanford and Son, which was sung by Billie Holiday. So there, there, there was an article from um, biography.com, biography.com, dealing with uh, Billie Holiday. And this one is uh, Billie Holiday, how the government targeted the strange fruit singer with drug arrest. Billie Holiday, how the government targeted the strange fruit singer 
with uh, drug arrest. Okay, and let me pull this back up here. So in 1939, uh, Billie Holiday rode the service elevator in the Midtown Manhattan Hotel on her way to sing uh, on her way to sing on stage. Of course, the hotel had a front door, but Billie Holiday was not allowed to use the front door because she was African American. Little did. Uh, she know this. Little did she know this was just the beginning of her tr of the troubles that will follow her that night. This is in 1939. Now, Billie Holiday stuck to her set li set list, including singing the song "Strange Fruit," a hauntingly emotional song uh, against uh, lynching, with lyrics like "Southern trees bear strange fruit, blood on the leaves." and blood at the root, black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. Now her self-described way of being able to quote, sing like an instrument, end quote, made the performance particularly effective. But that night, Billie Holiday received a warning from the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, the FBN, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which was a government agency which, which uh, lasted from 1930 to 1968. She, uh, the warning was she was never to sing the song again. Now the link between the song, Strange Fruit, and the anti-drug agency, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, may feel disjointed except the Federal Bureau of Narcotics Commissioner the white supremacist Harry J. Anslinger drew a direct correlation. To Harry J. Anslinger, Billie Holiday was the was like the symbol of everything that America had to be afraid of, said uh, uh, jo, uh, Joanne Hari, who wrote the book Chasing the Scream, Chasing the Scream, the first and last days of the war on drugs uh, in a uh, interview with WNYC. Uh, Harry said, quote, she had a heroin addiction because she'd been chronically raped as a child and she was trying to deal with the grief and the pain of that, okay? And let me turn on the screen. Let me uh, flip over here. Uh, let me show you this article here for just a second. This is a deep article from biography.com. Um, and they have a picture of uh, Harry J. Anslinger here also. Now, I I've talked about Anslinger a number of times on this show. You have to understand history to understand the war on drugs. Okay. Because a lot of people don't understand uh, the war on drugs and don't understand history. All of this is connected. So let me. Look over here just a second. All right. Check out this article here from biography.com. Billy Holiday, how the government targeted the strange fruit singer with drug arrests. Okay. This is uh, from February 26, 2021. Billy Holiday, how the government targeted the strange fruit singer with drug arrests. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics relentlessly pursued Billy Holiday. The chase largely fueled by Commissioner Harry J. Anslinger's biases. OK, uh, so here's a picture of this white supremacist, Harry J. Anslinger. Uh, to. To Harry Anslinger, Billie Holiday was like the symbol of everything that America had to be afraid of. She had a heroin addiction because she had been chronically raped as a child. And she was trying to deal with the grief and pain. She was trying to deal with the grief and pain of that. And also she was resisting white supremacy. She, Billie Holiday, was resisting white supremacy. And she was targeted for this. Just like Eartha Kitt was targeted. And when she insisted on continuing on her right as an American citizen to sing Strange Fruit, Harry J. Anslinger resolves to destroy her. 
Now, Anslinger was widely known as an extreme racist in the 1920s. When Harry J. Anslinger uh, first took on the role in the new agency that was part of the Treasury Department, he was determined to eradicate all drugs everywhere. He had previously been part of the Department of Prohibition, but since the, prohib since the, prohib since, uh, the prohibition had been abolished, he was more determined than ever to make a, a strict stance on drugs. All right. Now, um, let me bring back up the uh, picture of uh, Lady Day. So it's important also to understand the uh, impact of the story from the New York Times that I showed you uh, from February 8th, 1914, Negro cocaine fiends are a new Southern menace. And let me uh, show you this quickly here. For those just tuning in who didn't see this in the first half, this is a historic article from the New York Times from February 8th, 1914. This is exactly one year before the movie The Birth of a Nation came out, and the movie The Birth of a Nation rejuvenated the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan had largely died out by 1915. The Ku Klux Klan is going to be rejuvenated in October 1915 by Reverend William Joseph Simmons. Reverend, he was a minister. Reverend William Joseph Simmons, October 1915, after seeing the movie The Birth of a Nation, which made the... Uh, Ku Klux Klan, the heroes of like white America in, in this movie. The movie, The Birth of a Nation, debuted February 8th, 1915. Exactly one year before that movie, this was a front page article for the New York Times. Negro cocaine fiends are a new Southern menace. Murder and insanity increasing among lower class blacks because they have taken to sniffing sniffing, sniffing cocaine, since deprived of whiskey by prohibition. Okay, and then also look at this article here from uh, thenation.com. This one is dealing with uh, how racism and stereotypes and lies shape drug policies, how the myth of the Negro cocaine fiend Help shape American drug policy. How the myth of the Negro cocaine fiend helped shape American drug policy. And then you're going to see, as I lay this out with Harry J. Anslinger, you're going to see how Harry J. Anslinger lied in his testimony in front of Congress in 1937, which led to marijuana being made illegal. Which made to which made which led to marijuana being made illegal. This is why. When I hear people, and I've talked about this here before, when I hear people say, oh, marijuana shouldn't be made legal, things like this. No, the first question you have to ask is, why was marijuana made illegal in the first place? Because it used to be legal. Cannabis and hemp, all that stuff, that was legal for decades. Why was it made illegal? And then to do with, oh, it, it causes brain damage. That wasn't why it was made illegal. No. It was also it was a war on jazz singers. It was a war on jazz music. It was a war on African Americans and and, and Mexicans. It's white supremacy and racism. And if you do not understand European white supremacy and racism, what it is and how it works, everything else that you think that you understand will totally confuse you, as Dr. Francis Cress Wilson and Nilly Fuller correctly taught us. So how the myth of the Negro cocaine fiend helped shape American drug policy. In 1914, a racist fiction helped sell one of the nation's first drug laws. 100 years later, it's still with us. This article by Carl L. Hart is from January 29th, 2014. So this is one of the uh, articles that I was reading when I was doing my research dealing with the history of the war on drugs for my presentation that I did in 2016, dealing with uh, the history of Richard Nixon's war on drugs and how Richard Nixon's war on drugs was a war in the African-American community. Okay, once again, people, 
want to talk about mass incarceration. Mass incarceration goes back to the early 1970s. That's where you see the prison population starting to increase. Before then, there was relatively low prison population. They don't have nothing to do with the 13th Amendment. That's more BS that people don't understand. 13th Amendment is 1865. Why, why the hell it take 106 years for mass incarceration to take off if the 13th Amendment was was uh, written to re-enslave African-Americans and create mass incarceration, all this stuff. No, I'm a, a, a Dr. Daryl Scott, history professor at uh, Howard University, who, takes, who teaches a class on from uh, slavery to mass incarceration and has been speaking out about this whole 13th. Uh, he calls them the 13thers who think that uh, the 13th Amendment created a, 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 a loophole to re-enslave African-Americans and to uh, create mass incarceration, all this stuff. It's 106 years from 1865 to 1971. He 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 sent me a essay that he just wrote. I'm trying to interview him. So he said, uh, I'm trying to interview him for some months, but he said, you know, uh, he's contacted me because he's ready for an interview because we're going to put the, the history out to dispel all these myths. This is this is one of the problem. I like Ava DuVernay, but her, her documentary 13th is extremely flawed. It's historically flawed. Because the whole, her whole premise is flawed. All right, so um, Harry J. Anslinger was widely known as an extreme racist in the 1920s. When Anslinger first took on the role in the new agency that was part of the Treasury Department, he was determined uh, he was determined to eradicate all drugs, eradicate all drugs everywhere. He had previously been part of the Department of Prohibition, but since the prohibition uh, had been abolished, the prohibition of alcohol, since that had been abolished, he was more determined than ever to take a strict stance on drugs. All right. Now, and, and, and see the, the, the whole thing with prohibition. OK, that was targeting. Um, that was see the Ku Klux Klan. Was for prohibition. And there's a there's a there's a documentary on uh, I can't I think it was it's either the American Heroes Channel or the History Channel. It's a documentary I saw that dealt with how the Ku Klux Klan gave rise to the mafia. And it dealt with how the Klan, who's made up of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant males. There's a whole history about Anglos and the Saxons, two Germanic groups of barbarians. And England is named after the Anglos. There's a whole nother history. I don't have time to get into that. But the Klan, they had a problem with alcohol because of in the beer and things like this because of who was making it, like the Germans and these other European immigrants that the white Anglo-Saxon male Protestant immigrants had a problem with. So in by supporting prohibition, this then gave rise to the Italian mafia, the Italian immigrants, but also the, during prohibition, this is going to give rise to the Jewish mafia. And we know 80% of the illegal alcohol that came into the U.S. came from Canada into Michigan, basically kind of into Detroit, because Detroit, uh, uh, um, Canada is just right across the Detroit River. OK, you go down to uh, uh, you go down to Hart Plaza. We can look across the water and see Canada. OK, the. The Purple Gang, which was a Jewish uh, criminal gang, the Purple Gang controlled the flow of alcohol coming from Canada into the U.S. coming through Detroit. So the Ku Klux Klan supporting prohibition helps to give rise. I'm not saying they created it, but it helps to give rise to organized crime, helps to give rise to the Italian mafia, the Jewish mafia, because it then helps to create this this uh, underworld, this uh, this black market for alcohol during prohibition. There's a fascinating documentary that dealt with how the Ku Klux Klan gave rise to the uh, uh, Italian mafia, things like this. Al Capone, and Frank Nitti, all these guys that you see on the Untouchables TV show. OK, well, <laughs> all this history is connected. 
All right, we're coming up here on the break in uh, uh, just a minute here. Let's continue. Okay, so among Harry J. Anslinger's strategies was his belief that jazz music was a part of the problem. Because originally jazz music was called jackass music, okay? And it was something associated with largely African Americans. Now, quote, it sounded like the jungles. Harry J. Anslinger said it sounded like the jungles in the dead of night. A memo he wrote said, while another said, quote, unbelievably ancient, indecent rites, R-I-T-E-S, of the East Indies are resurrected, end quote. And, and that the songs, quote, reek of filth. The songs reek of filth. Now, his agents even reported back to him that, quote, many among the jazz men think they are playing magnificently when under the influence of marijuana, but they are actually becoming hopelessly confused and playing horribly, end quote. So he launches this campaign against marijuana. He writes essays, he writes articles. Uh, th th you also have a movie out called uh, Reefer Madness. And they're using the media to then shape the way or reshape the way people think about marijuana to then justify making marijuana illegal and is largely based upon lies and stereotypes and racism. We'll deal with this on the other side of the break. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. In a few minutes. Black Bean's products are a collection of natural, organic, personal care products with an appreciation of nature and bees. Our philosophy is without bees, we have nothing. We are honoring our Nile Valley ancestors who understood the importance of bees. Black Bees created a high quality, natural, organic, personal care line that would be affordable to everyone. Hope you try and enjoy our Black Bees products line and come back and visit us at blackbeesproducts.com. With blackbusinesstea.com, the messages are clear and meaningful. Keep your business in the black and out of the red. Mind your black business, know your numbers, and plan strategically. Black business boss, lead your industry. Support black business encourage patronize and uplift one another blackbusinesstea.com currently has products sold in detroit atlanta chicago and los angeles with proceeds returned to the black community they have a wide selection of hoodies t-shirts mugs hats sweatshirts that support black owned businesses Visit the website blackbusinesstea.com. That's blackbusinesstea.com. Soul Natural Beauty Products offers organic, plant based skin and hair care products that will rejuvenate skin and naturally grow and thicken hair. Their whipped shea butter can heal or restore damaged skin cells to prevent hyperpigmentation and skin breakouts. All products are made with organic, plant based ingredients. Their maximum hair growth oil is fortified with organic herbal extracts and undeniably proves that Mother Nature knows best. It thickens, lengthens, softens, and conditions all types of hair. They even guarantee hair improvement within 90 days or a full refund. Their all-natural 24-hour deodorant leaves the body smelling fresh without sweating for up to 24 hours. It does not stain fabric, goes on smoothly, and has a refreshing lavender and frankincense aroma. It can be used by men, women, and even children. Place your order today at SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. That's SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. 
All right, welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Bella Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, February 28th, 2021. It's the last day of African American History Month, but you know for us, it doesn't stop. We don't just deal with our history one month out of the year, and it was never designed to be the only time of the year that we study our history and things like this. It's a celebration of uh, our history and accomplishments and achievements. So you'll hear more about uh, uh, you'll hear more about that as well. Dealing with African American History Month and this year's annual theme, which is the Black Family uh, Representation and uh, the the, uh, the Black Family Representation Diversity and um, I'll pull it up here just a second here. Um, Okay, let me pull up this other picture. All right, 313-778-7600 is uh, calling number if you have a question or comment here. So we're talking about uh, the United States versus Billie Holiday and the war on drugs in the new movie out about Billie Holiday from uh, director Lee Daniels. It uh, premiered on the streaming service Hulu and I just renewed my subscription to Hulu. I haven't had Hulu in three, four years. But because of this, because I'm talking about it, I renewed my subscription to Hulu. OK. And uh, I mean, Hulu's a good service, but I'm just so busy. And I had Netflix. I net, let Netflix lapse because I only watch Netflix once a month. Uh, so, you know, most of the time I have on MSNBC and MSNBC is on right now. It's just muted. OK, so. <laughs> A lot of this stuff, man, I don't have time to watch. But, you know, a lot of these historical films, you know, I, I, I want to I want to see them. All right. All right. Um, OK, so let's continue here. Okay, so right before the break, we were talking about um, Harry J. Anslinger. Now, the the reason for Harry J. Anslinger, who was the first uh, chairman of the Federal Bureau, Bureau of Narcotics, the reason for his targeting of a genre of music came down to his widely known bias. Quote, you have to understand that he was regarded as an extreme racist in the 1920s, okay? He used the N-word so often in official memos, in official memos, that his own senators said he said he should have to resign. And in the movie, he's using the N-word freely, okay? This is how, how much of a bigot he was. So the policies that he fought for followed his warped mindset, his warped thinking, his, the hatred that he had, the policies he followed and who he, uh, the policies he pushed for and who he targeted followed his mindset. Your thoughts create feelings, your feelings, feelings create actions and behaviors, your actions and behaviors create results. Your thoughts create feelings, your feelings create actions and behaviors, your actions and behaviors create results. So, uh, so the controversial nature of the song Strange Fruit among the music scape at the time gave him the excuse he needed to go after Billie Holiday. Quote, this was not a time when there was political pop songs, uh, uh, Harry, uh, Harry said. Quote, and to have an African-American woman standing in front of a white audience singing a song against white supremacy and its violence was viscerally shocking at the moment. Coupled with Billie Holiday's known struggles with alcohol and drug addiction over the year, Harry J. Anslinger became laser focused on taking Billie Holiday down. And let's flip over here to uh, back to this article for just a second. So 
what you see here, once again, politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, their adop adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. We see the correlation between government and who is in office, who's in various positions. We see the correlation between that and policy. Okay, now here's a picture of uh, Billy Holiday also. This is from 1949. Okay, this is uh, 10 years before she passed away. Now, Harry J. Anslinger sent undercover agents after Billy Holiday. Okay, we'll continue with this here. Just a second. Let's bring that back up. So he sent undercover agents after Billy Holiday. One of them was an African American man, uh, Fletcher. You saw portrayed in the uh, film. And despite the fact that Harry J. Anslinger did not like hiring African American agents, I wonder what he said about them behind their backs. He assigned Jimmy Fletcher to investigate Billie Holiday since she was based in Harlem, New York, and he wanted his agent to be able to blend in. Jimmy Fletcher himself believed, quote, you victimize yourself by becoming a junkie, end quote. So he seemed like the right fit for the job. Now, Jimmy Fletcher uh, soon frequented Billie Holiday's neighborhood and saw her drinking and doing cocaine firsthand. And you see this depicted uh, in the film towards the beginning of the, of the movie. But Billie Holiday noticed him around too and grew to like him. Although Billy Fletcher, although Jimmy Fletcher did eventually have to raid her, they grew close and were even seen dancing together at Club Ebony. Quote, I had so many close conversations with her about so many things, Jimmy Fletcher later said, uh, according to Harry, Harry, who said the uh, agent fell in love with Billie Holiday. Uh, she was the type who would make anyone sympathetic because she was the loving type. OK, so this is um, John uh, Harry in an interview with uh, WNYC, uh, author of the book. Uh, chasing the Screen, Chasing the Screen, The First and Last Days of the War on Drugs. Chasing the Screen, The First and Last Days of uh, the War on Drugs. Okay, let's continue here. So, let me flip back over. Uh, here we go. All right. So Billie Holiday's husband worked with the Federal Bureau, Bureau of Narcotics also to set her up. So around the time, uh, Billie Holiday would often show up to her performances beaten by her husband. Louis McKay, uh, her husband, Louis McKay, so she eventually cut him off. He was so enraged, even being quoted as saying, quote, I got enough to finish her off, end quote, uh, Mari wrote in Politico, Politico.com. Louis McKay went down to Washington, D.C., met with Harry J. Anslinger, and they decided that Louis McKay would set J uh, 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 Billie Holiday up. Billie Holiday was caught and put on trial. Quote, it was called the United States of America versus Billie Holiday. And that's just the way it felt. Uh, Billie Holiday wrote in her autobiography, despite telling the judge that she simply wanted the opportunity to recover and find, quote unquote, the cure. She was sentenced to a year in prison in West Virginia, where she had to kick her drug habit, but also did not sing a note. When she was released from Alderson Federal Prison in 1947, her license to perform at cabarets was revoked, but that did not seem to phase her. Shortly thereafter, she played a sold out uh, show at Carnegie Hall, a venue she went on to perform at more than 22 times. Now, even after reportedly being framed, Billie Holiday continued to perform the song Strange Fruit. 
Now, Harry J. Anslinger wasn't done with Billie Holiday. He recruited Colonel George White, who was a, quote, sensation as the first and only white man ever to infiltrate a Chinese drug gang. And he even learned to speak in Mandarin, Mandarin Chinese, so he could chant their odes with them, end quote. At a time when Billie Holiday claimed she had been clean for more than a year, Colonel George White busted Billie Holiday at San Francisco's Mark Twain Hotel, saying he found opium in a wastebasket and a heroin kit in the room. It's pretty clear, I think, from reading the historical documents that Colonel George White planted drugs on Billie Holiday that night. Uh, Johan, uh, Johan Harry said, quote, she's broken and destroyed again. She's really back on the path of addiction, end quote. Now, this time, things didn't quite bounce back. Billie Holiday uh, would go through remission only to be addicted once again. And her career spiraled along with it. But she kept performing through the 1950s. And most importantly, she kept singing the song Strange Fruit. The king of courage, not only that, the, the, sorry, the kind of courage, not only that she would uh, risk her career and her career mobility, but that she actually risked her life and her freedom because she felt that she had to sing this song. Uh, uh, Farrah Jasmine Griffin of Columbia University's African American and African Diaspora Studies told NPR National Public Radio. Now, Harry J. Anslinger continued to pursue Billie Holiday in the hospital. One day in 1959, and this is the same year that she died, one day in 1959, Billie Holiday collapsed and was sent to the hospital, and she feared. Harry J. Anslinger was not done with her yet, even after she was diagnosed with liver disease. Johan uh, Harry said, quote, so she's very ill and she goes into heroin withdrawal because she's not given any heroin in the hospital. And Maylee Dufty, T-U-F-T-Y, her friend, managed to insist that she was given methadone and she began to recover. Obviously, heroin, with, heroin withdrawal is very dangerous if you're extremely physically weak, as she was, end quote. And then Billie Holiday's worry came true. Harry J. Anslinger's team arrested her on her hospital bed. Quote, it sort of, it, it sort of was like the last straw that the public or the system could do to her. And I think that really took the heart out of her. Billie Holiday's friend, Alice uh, Burpsky uh, said, it became clear what was happening and protests were even held outside the hospital as people carried signs saying, let Lady, let Lady Day live, let Lady Day live, referring to her by her nickname, Lady Day. But after 10 days, the methadone was cut off on Harry J. Anslinger's instruction. This is, you, you got to be a vile white supremacist, bigot racist. Hey, Harry J. Anslinger probably would have been storming the U.S. Capitol building January 6th with the other domestic terrorists. After 10 days, the methadone was cut off on Anslinger's instruction. Uh, Alice Verbsky, uh, Billie Holiday's friend said she was in very bad shape. I could see on her face and in her whole condition that she was not well. And on July 17th, 1959, Billie Holiday died. Now, Anslinger reportedly was satisfied writing, quote, for her, there would be no more good morning heartache, end quote, uh, Johan Har Harry wrote. Anslinger has succeeded in his decades long pursuit to take down Billie Holiday, a task fueled by his own racist, white supremacist views. Now, when it came to Judy Garland and Judy Garland's drug addiction, Judy Garland, we know, was in uh, The Wizard of Oz 
and mother to Liza Minnelli. When it came to Judy Garland's drug addiction, the white woman, Harry J. Anslinger told her to take long vacations, take longer vacations, take longer vacations. In September 1962, Anslinger was even honored by President John F. Kennedy for his work on the war on drugs. While Billie Holiday unfairly met her end, her legacy and determination transcend today. We're at the point now where we applaud anything like, oh, such a such and such a person took a stance, end quote. Uh, they aren't going to get the hit that Billie Holiday got. They aren't going to go on to prison because they sang a song, right? So I think it's important to remember that she did that she did that when the cost and the consequences were much, much harsher. Okay. She did this at a point in time when the cost and the consequences were much, much harsher. Okay. She had the federal government uh, after her. So check out this article uh, here from biography.com from uh, February 26, 2021. Billie Holiday, how the government targeted the strange fruit singer with drug arrest by Rachel Chang. Uh, it's, a, it's a great article here. It's an important piece of history. Billie Holiday, how the government targeted the strange fruit singer with drug arrest. Okay, now I, I want to go to uh, I'm this go other to this piece here, here from timeline.com, uh, Harry J. Anderson. But also one from um, uh, The Atlantic. All right. And the one from The Atlantic, I, I talked about this a couple weeks ago. This, this one from The Atlantic is called how uh, neuroscience reinforces racist drug policy, how neuroscience reinforces racist drug policy. Brain scan, this is from June 12, 2014. Brain scans do not speak for themselves. The seemingly Objective science of neuroimaging can be used to justify a moral argument for or against legal marijuana to show it as a to show it as a legitimate medicine or as a danger to your health. This is by Nathan Greenslit, June 12, 2014. OK, and let me see who is this? Rachel. Hey, thanks for the donation, Rachel. Thank you. Um, there's, there's a something here in the article I want to zoom in on because they talk about Harry J. Anslinger in the article. When I was doing my research in 2016, preparing to do a uh, lecture dealing with the history of the war on drugs, this is one of the articles I came across. Neuroscience participates in a sophisticated form of revisionist history. It turns public discourse away from the fact that marijuana is not illegal because it was discovered to cause brain damage. It was made illegal because of an early 20th century fear mongering campaign to associate it with Mexican immigrants. And to understand the hatred that many people in the U.S., especially many white people in the U.S., have for Mexico and Mexicans, you have to understand about the last 150 years or so of U.S.-Mexico relations and the Mexican-American War of 1846 to 1848 that ends with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848 and the U.S., because of this treaty and going to war with Europeans Mexico, here in the U.S., the, US the United States, wanted to take over the entire North American continent. They wanted to take over the entire North American continent. And because of that treaty, the U.S. got California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, all from Mexico. 
because of the Mexican-American War. And then in the early 1900s, you had Mexicans coming into the U.S. and there was a hatred towards these Mexicans. So cannabis or hemp gets relabeled as marijuana and marijuana was a Spanish term. So the hatred that many white people in this country have for Mexicans got transferred to cannabis or hemp with putting the, the Spanish term on it, marijuana. As long as white people were using it, it wasn't a problem. When non-white people start using these drugs and marijuana, it becomes a problem. So you relabel something that you were already using. You relabel it with a term associated with people you despise, which then changes the way people think about it. And then you launch a media campaign against marijuana, cannabis, to reshape the way people think about it, to then justify attacking people and dehumanizing and mistreating people. And this is what happened. So we go back to this article from The Atlantic. Neuroscience participates in a sophisticated form of revisionist history. It turns public discourse away from the fact that marijuana is not illegal because it was discovered to cause brain damage, but because of an early 20th century fear mongering campaign to associate it with Mexican immigrant workers. I remember somebody talking about Mexicans were rapists and murderers and they bring drugs into this country. Who who was bringing drugs into this country before Mexicans started doing it? I'm just curious. That campaign infamously led by the first director of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, Harry J. Anslinger, culminated in the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937. Federal legislation that prohibitively taxed cannabis and hemp. Harry J. Anslinger had also become particularly adept at using public media to propagandize the evils of marijuana. His essay, Marijuana Assassin of Youth, was published in the American Magazine that same year. In this article, Harry J. Anslinger offered panic-inducing musings, panic-inducing musings. How many murders, suicides, robberies, criminal assaults, holdups, burglaries, and deeds of maniacal insanity it causes each year, especially among the young, can only be conjectured, can only be guessed. Nobody knows how, much, how, how many people does this marijuana kill? We got to make this illegal. No, no one knows when he places a marijuana cigarette to his lips whether he will become a joyous reveler in a musical heaven, a mad insinate, a calm philosopher, or a murderer. Sensationalism like this was specifically aimed at white readership. Scared the hell out of white people. Sensationalism like this was specifically aimed at white readership that might worry about such unfathomably dangerous ethnic, ethnic drug getting into the hands of children. Now, Harry J. Anslinger's congressional testimony directly betrayed his racist motivations to enact federal legislation against marijuana. Now, this is before he goes after Billy Holiday. This is 1937. He said, he, this fool testified in front of Congress. This fool said, quote, there are 100,000 total marijuana smokers in the U.S., and most are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. Their satanic music, jazz and swing, jazz music and swing music, not swinging, that's something else. We can do a show about that, but we ain't talking about that right now. Jazz and swing result from marijuana usage. This, everybody pay attention to this. This is what this fool said to Congress. This, let me blow this up. Ain't gonna believe, I'm, trying, I'm trying to tell you, you don't understand how deep this is. The, this marijuana usage 
causes white women to seek sexual relations with Negroes, entertainers, and any others. Whoop, there it is. That's, that's what this is about. It, 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 it is right there. Okay. <laughs> that, this, this is the same thing that was taking place in Europe with the Moors intermixing with the European population, changing the complexion of Europeans. And they said, we got to put a stop to this. <laughs> this is the same thing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and so when you look at the lynchings that took place, a lot of the lynchings took place because of allegations of African-American men having sex with white women. That's a lot of that sounds with different. you. Okay. And this is what, this is what Ida B. Wells discovered when she started doing her research on lynchings. Okay. And she started finding out and she actually wrote about this and got in, in, in her uh, newspaper office, got attacked. Uh, Ida B. Wells find, found out because she, Ida B. Wells gets involved in the uh, uh, anti-lynching movement because of the Moss uh, store murders in 1892 in Memphis, Tennessee. Three of her friends get uh, uh, attacked by a white mob and they're lynched, taken out of the jail and lynched, right? Um, Tom Moss, who was the owner of the People's Grocery Store in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. So she started doing research, okay? She's a journalist and newspaper publisher. So she starts doing research on lynchings and she finds, finds out a lot of the lynchings were because of consensual sex between African-American men and white women, and then the woman's husband found out or her brother found out or her father found out or something like that, and they go get the good old boys and lynch him. But it was consensual sex. So, uh, let me flip back over to this here. So every word, even the word marijuana, even the word marijuana, a Mexican-Spanish word, was a strategic choice on Harry J. Anslinger's part. This word recast cannabis already in the lexicon of physicians who for decades have been using its tinctures to treat pain and incontinence as a specifically ethnic plant. They're changing, they're using language. They're changing the way people think about this plant and who uses it to then justify attacking these people and jailing them, killing them, what have you. The American Medical Association, the AMA, which opposed the proposed tax, felt blindsided and duped by the 1937 hearings. Okay, so re read the rest of this article here. Okay, uh, this is from theAtlantic.com how neuroscience reinforces racist drug policy. And this ties into Harry J. Anslinger and the war on drugs. Okay, this is before Richard Nixon. Okay, this war on drugs doesn't lead to what we call, what some people call mass incarceration, but it's a war on drugs and, and it's attacking African-Americans, Hispanics, uh, Filipinos, things like this. Now, there's another article from Timeline.com, and, and I posted this years ago, a couple of years ago. This came out February 2018, February 28th, 2018. Okay, exactly three years ago today. And I've posted this article a few times here and talked about it on this show. Um, how a racist hate monger masterminded America's war on drugs. How a racist hate monger masterminded America's war on drugs. Harry J. Anslinger conflated drug use, race, and music to criminalize non-whiteness and create a prison industrial complex. This is by Laura Smith, February 28th, 2018. Okay? And uh, just for the sake of time, we're going to go to that clip from uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered here also. I'm going to squeeze that in, uh, Jalen. All right, so get that queued up. Uh, so here we have uh, Louis Armstrong performing at Brooklyn College in 1941 and the white, and the white youth, the, see the white youth love this music. And one of the things that they did not want to happen, one of the things that a lot of white people in power did not want to happen, they did not want African-American youth dancing 
with white youth because they know if they dance, there's going to be some intermixing taking place. And then you're going to have biracial children. They, they know this. Okay, so in 1930, Harry J. Anslinger was appointed to helm the newly minted uh, Federal Bureau of Narcotics by uh, Herbert Hoover. President Herbert Hoover became president in 1928. Um, during the early parts of his career, Anslinger seemed likely uh, seemed little concerned about marijuana, known by most as cannabis. But when uh, prohibition Let's see here. Uh, during the early part of his career, Anslinger seemed little concerned about marijuana, uh, known by most as cannabis. But when prohibition ended, it looked as though Anslinger might be out of a job. So he sought a new threat to the American way, essentially manufacturing a drug war, essentially manufacturing a drug law. As Johan Hari explains in the book, Chasing the Screen, the first and last days of the war on drugs, who was quoted in the article from biography. Anslinger's office was focused on cocaine and heroin, but there was relatively small numbers of users. In order to ensure a promising future for his bureau, he needed more, Harry writes. Marijuana was Anslinger's golden ticket. He used his office to trumpet the association between weed and violence so that it could be criminalized. He used his office to trumpet the association between marijuana, cannabis, and violence so that it could be criminalized. Quote, you smoke a joint and you're likely, likely to kill your brother, end quote, he was known to have said. Now, um, for, okay, so we talked about his congressional testimony as well. We talked about that. Uh, as as um, John Harry goes on to write, quote, jazz was the opposite of everything Harry Anslinger believed in. It improvised. Re, uh, it, it is improvised, relaxed, free form. It follows its own rhythm. It follows its own rhythm. Worst of all, it is a mongrel music made up of European, Caribbean, and African echoes, all mating on American shores. To Harry J. Anslinger, this was musical anarchy and evidence of a recurrence of the primitive impulses that lurk in Black people waiting to emerge. Quote, it sounded his internal. It sounded, his internal memo said, like the jungles in the dead of night. All right. So uh, read the rest of this article here from Timeline.com. From February 28th, 2018, how a racist hate monger masterminded America's war on drugs. Harry Anslinger conflated drug use, race and music to criminalize non-whiteness and create a prison industrial complex. And this is the same Harry Anslinger who brought down Lady Day, Billie Holiday. All right. Um, those watching on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P. Keep watching. We're going to keep broadcasting and keep this discussion uh, going for a few more minutes. Uh, if you like this information, you can support The African History Network. Uh, we're here six days a week. OK, so uh, dollar sign the AHN show through cash app, dollar sign the AHN show through cash app, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show and at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, we have a uh, promotion going on for a, a day or two more end of the month, a Black History Month sale. Uh, spend a hundred dollars or more on DVD, DVD lectures and digital downloads at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Get 20 percent off. Uh, your order. Okay, that's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And uh, we have that going for a day or two more. Uh, we have the information right on the homepage. Use promo code AHN20 off 2021. AHN20 off 2021. And also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Be sure to register for the online course that I teach. 
ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Uh, next class is uh, Tuesday, uh, March 2nd, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We deal with thousands of years of history. We do the classes live. All the classes are recorded. You can go back and watch them over and over again, watch them around the world. So uh, classes on sale, $80, regularly $130. It's going to blow you away. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have video clip, book book references, everything, okay? All right. Remember, right now, it's correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. Stay tuned for uh, the best of Reverend Al Sharpton. We'll talk to you uh, tomorrow night. Peace. Okay, let's keep going. How's everybody doing? We're going to keep going for a few more minutes. African American business owners post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. Also, you can um, email us at uh, customer service at African History Network dot com. Customer service at African History Network dot com. Let you know how you can advertise with the African History Network. I'm working on uh, um, ads all week. We have some new advertisers started with us. I'm working on ads all this week. Um, and, and then we also have the uh, Michael M. Hotel uh, uh, DVD bundle pack. The um, 15. Uh, the Black History Month 15 DVD bundle pack, uh, Michael M. Hotel 15 month, uh, 15 uh, DVD uh, bundle pack for Black History Month. Uh, that's at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com also. So check that out as well. You can use the 20% off on that uh, bundle. We just posted it uh, here on the thread of our broadcast. We posted the link here. And when you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, we have it uh, right on the home page here. So let me just show you this quickly. And then we'll get back to, uh, I'm gonna go to this clip here uh, when I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday, February 26th. Uh, and we talked about the uh, $1.9 trillion American Rescue Bill, uh, Coronavirus American Rescue Plan and uh, raising the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour. We discussed all of that. Okay, let's go to, where is that here? Okay, so if you go to our website, africanhistorynetwork.com and uh, around the home page and then uh, scroll down, it, uh, where am I? Just one second. I'm trying to find the. Okay, here we go. Yeah, when you scroll down, uh, you'll see the info for the uh, twenty percent off uh, orders of a hundred dollars or more. You see that info there, and then information about our radio show Monday through Fridays, eleven p.m. to twelve midnight Eastern Standard Time. Sundays, nine p.m. to eleven p.m. You can read articles that I've written here. Click right here. Also, the article dealing with the history of African American History Month. And Dr. Carter G. Woodson is there as well. Click right there. Here's information about the online course. You can register here for it. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Um, you click here. It takes you to the next page. Click on Enroll. And as soon as you enroll, you can start uh, watching the content. Uh, you scroll down. I was on the panel discussion for Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. Let's celebrate, celebrate Black History. That was Wednesday, February 24th. So shout out to uh, Sister Marnice Chris Jackson for uh, inviting me onto the panel. And then here's uh, the uh, 15 DVD bundle pack, 15 uh, Michael M. Hotel Black History Month, 15 DVD bundle pack. And you click right here, takes you to the next page. And 